Today on The Big Questions, did man create God? Good morning, good to see you. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. Today we're back at Witchwood School in Oxford to debate one very big question. Did man create God? Welcome everyone to The Big Questions. <laughs> now, the, the dawning of religious belief is suggested by the graves of Neanderthals and other early hominids who lived between 225,000 and 100,000 years ago. By around 10,000 BC, Organised religions emerged within the first Neolithic cities, states and kingdoms like Gopekli Tepe in what is now Turkey, the oldest human-made place of worship yet discovered. And the first wooden posts were erected at the site of Stonehenge 2,000 years later. Hinduism, the world's oldest living religion, began to emerge in the Indus Valley around 5,000 years ago. Religious beliefs and practices are probably as old as mankind which came first, man or gods? Did man create God? Well, to debate that, we've uh, gathered together a distinguished array of theologians, philosophers, psychologists, writers, people from various faiths and of none. And you can join in too on Twitter or online by logging on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions. Follow the link to the online discussion and lots of encouragement, contributions from our extremely erudite Oxford audience, um, Bruce Hood, Professor Bruce Hood, experimental psychologist, <coughs> Bristol University. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Nicky. Right. Our species, Homo sapiens, we emerged from Homo erectus, Heidelbergensis, Agasta, about um, 150,000, 100,000 years ago. Our brains grew gradually and they got to the point that they are at today. Why did we start to need to believe? Well, uh, we're a social animal and... Um, social groups coalesce around belief systems and it's a very powerful mechanism to identify who's the member of your group especially if you have to take their beliefs on trust in the absence of evidence but of course our brains have evolved to try and make sense of the world to try and predict it and an unpredictable world is pretty frightening so if you don't know what's going to happen with the crops or the migration of animals you might try and engage in some activities to try and control that that's just in our nature to do this so i can see the origins of rituals as serving a purpose to try and explain the world around you, but also as a mechanism to kind of coalesce social groups. What about dealing with mortality, understanding mortality and uh, finding solace for those we've lost? Was that an important factor, do you think? Absolutely. I think the fact that there were, there were ritual practices and graves must have been some sense of the afterlife. I think most of us still have this urge and need to know what's going to happen to us, so that's never really going to go away. And, and of course, if someone provides a very... Uh, good story about what happens, then that's easily understood and accepted. Mm. And we can understand that need yeah. very much, as we know if we've, if we've lost uh, loved ones. So, Professor Theresa Morgan, here's the thing. It's a long span of time, isn't it? Homo sapiens, 150,000, 100,000 years. Um, why did we, as a species, live until 5,000 years ago, believing in supernatural forces and animism and river sprites and gods of thunder and it took until then to get the idea of a single creator it's uh, if god created man it's a bit late in the day isn't it uh, well we don't know very much about what people thought more than 5000 years ago because they didn't leave written records so they didn't describe uh, very much about you know what they did we don't really know actually i wanted to answer bruce more directly and say that what worries me about that kind of explanation is if you Take an example of something else that is very important to us, but a bit different from religion, something like love. A sociologist can say, well, it's all about, you know, creating stable social structures. And a psychologist can say, well, it's just, you know, it's a byproduct of evolution or it's a way of creating bonding so that parents look after their children and all that. But actually, our own experience of love and say love that creates a long term relationship is that it's far more than that. And I think sort of it's, um, explanations of religion that try to explain religion away never quite capture the full richness of experience of people who believe. Um, and uh, so I would say that, you know, it, there's always a difference between the sort of the insider and the outsider perspective. 
Well, I believe we didn't in quite, fantasy. Okay, Bruce, we didn't quite get to the question, which I, which I, I appreciate what you're saying. I want to come back to it, but. Uh, uh, Arif, do you want to come in here? Yeah, well, I mean, well, of course, there is a difference to <laughs> the insider and the outsider perspective. It could be said by anyone who believes any kind of conspiracy theory or any of the 99,000 religions which you, presumably, and all religious people believe to be, to be nonsense. Um, the other thing I would say is that, of course, what, what Professor Hood does, it two things about what Professor Hood said. I mean, one of them is that it shows that the widespreadness of religious belief is no evidence whatever for its truth, OK, because it can be explained in other ways. So there isn't the slightest reason to believe that. And the other thing I would say is that he doesn't have to show it decisively to be true for the purposes of this debate. He doesn't have to overcome all the competing scientific theories for the purposes of this debate or, or um, any sentimentalism about, about love or other things. He has to show that it's more likely than people who believe in talking snakes and resurrection. Can I, I, come, can I come back to that first point again? Can you go with me on this? Mm. Uh, there's lots of uh, evidence of goddesses before and many gods and animism and people worshipping animal gods but there is very little evidence going back tens of thousands of years of worship of monotheistic faith can you just address this S say i'm right why <laughs> would why would a rare occasion why would the idea of this single divine entity come so late to mankind well i still think you don't know actually whether it did or not go with However, me go with me aside, just pretend. <laughs> Leaving that aside. Why would that I mean, happen? I think you might say in a lot of religious traditions that there is a tendency for a sense of multiple divinities to coalesce over time into a sense of a single divinity. And I think it happens for different reasons. Um, one is that, um, uh, one, um, a sort of brute type explanation might be that um, single divinities are more powerful, more complex, and therefore more satisfying, more psychologically satisfying. Another reason is that cultures collide and get into wars with one another, and as it were, um, uh, you decide that your god is, first of all, the strongest among all the local gods, uh, that you know, there is a little bit of early evidence in the Hebrew Bible, for instance, for uh, believers in the God of Israel thinking of him as the strongest of local I'm going gods. I'm further back than that, but you're well, saying it's a kind of logical conclusion. Over time. Yeah, okay. over time it a develops into the sense that there is actually okay. only one real god. For that Francesca. seems to be quite a common but principle. Surely also the, the, there's the, oh. the fact is that monotheist <laughs> gods do something wonderful, which, which, uh, which other gods don't do. They're wonderful oh, for they empires. Yeah, They're they wonderful do. for bringing <laughs> a whole lot of heterogeneous well, one people flag, together. One flag, one god, one nation. You go for one, one god yeah. and then you all agree with each other, this is, this is my guy. Mm. And that's, for, for empires, that's... that's let me take it back. We're, we're, we're navigating some, f some fascinating terrain here. Well, why not, I mean, going back, is there evidence of monotheism going back 40, 50, 60,000 years? No, but there's um, evidence of very much smaller uh, groups of deities. Uh, the, the question about love I thought was really interesting because, of course, love is exactly the same as a, as a social explanation for belief or religious practice. Love is exactly the same. We begin to believe, we begin to develop and construct the notion of a deity, something beyond us, because of our continuing social bonds with the people that have gone, with the dead, dead people, our ancestors. And these gods basically become more and more powerful, um, but it's purely because of love. We, we are unable to let go or sever Bonds, I, even those of us that, that don't think that's, that's, <clears throat> that's love is still it's one of the greatest social it's not just a social tool it's it, we are social beings and it's what keeps us all together Elaine Storkey um, theologian and author it, you know we are social beings it keeps us together social cohesion and also um, the, the creation of myths and telling stories to each other around the fire the uh, remembrance of of those who are gone uh, you can understand the logic from this side of the argument about that. But if, if we were created in the image of God, and I know you believe that, what about, I mean, there's evidence of ritualistic behaviour by Neanderthals. Were they, for example, created in the image of God? Huh. <laughs> there were so many things all packed into it. Well, the that, take the last question first. <laughs> um, the last question of a rather rambling question. <laughs> yeah. Neanderthals, would they have been created in the image if, of God? If they were human beings, yes. Well, they, they, were, they were a species of human beings. Yes, well, I mean, in a sense, does it matter whether they were or not? So that's the first question. Um, I'm agnostic on Neanderthals, completely agnostic. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that I believe that they were there at some point in even uh, human evolution. Yeah. Same whether, time as us. They're whether they were here. human in the same way that we are, um, and mm. therefore, in a sense, whether they had the same relationship with God that human, human life has is, is for me questionable. Um, and therefore, I'm agnostic on it. I'm not. Well, it's interesting, but there are four or five species of human on the planet at the same time about 50,000 years ago. Right, are we, yes. But we are the survivors. Bruce? The point of information is that they're still here. 
Um, genetically, we contain DNA from the Anatols. Unless, unless you're from Africa. That's the interesting point, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'd say monotheism predates polytheism. Um, basically, if, if, <laughs> if you took all the scriptures of all, uh, all the writing of the world and, and everything, removed it, 5,000 years in the future, people would say, well, Islam and uh, Judaism didn't believe in any god because we can't find any statues of uh, the gods of Judaism and Islam. You can and, and so on, right? What's, what's your um, well, no, not of Islam and Judaism, no, I would, I would beg what, to what, differ. No, no, you, you and, and of course, if you, look at all, if you look at all world religions, um, polytheistic ones, ones, the Mayans and the, the Egyptians and so on, they always have a head god, a creator god, in some cases not even represented with an image. What I would say is that polytheism is a degeneration of monotheism. Oh. And, I think, and, I, and I think all that the, the research um, has shown by some of the uh, research down, down there has shown that humans have a tendency to believe in superstition and anthropomorphize the natural world, yes, but it doesn't mean the natural world doesn't exist just because humans anthropomorphize. Okay. The sun exists, even though people used to think it was a man or a woman, or that the, the sky was made of a woman, which was an Egyptian belief. But it doesn't mean that the sky doesn't exist and the sun doesn't exist. It means that humans have incorrectly anthropomorphized the natural world, and they've also incorrectly anthropomorphized God. But people come to the conclusion of God because God is the rational conclusion based mm. on the problem of Abdullah, causality. When you said uh, that polytheism was a degeneration from monotheism, yeah. um, I don't remember, there, used to, there was a comedian once called Frankie Howard, used to go, oh, <laughs> 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 you just did that, Tim. I did just do that, yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I thought when you said there's a comedian who used to, and then you pointed at me, I thought I was going to be the comedian. <laughs> <laughs> but, you can do maybe. a turn if you like. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I mean, firstly, there's absolutely no evidence that uh, monotheism predates polytheism. And we need to talk in terms of evidence, don't we? I mean, you've got to be responsible and rational about this. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we need evidence, OK? The oldest uh, evidence that we have for religious practice is uh, polytheistic, OK? The other thing I'd say is that we're folding an awful lot in here together. Um, religion is a modern category. I mean, it's been very well documented, lots of studies on this. Um, religion is, is a way of understanding the world that we impose on things. So all of these things that we're talking about here, say ritualised behaviour by um, early homo sapiens... Mm. Um, and, and other hominids. And um, other hominids. Um, civic cult in ancient Greece, mm. um, modern uh, uh, Islam, Judeo-Christian Judeo monotheism and so forth. Uh, these are not necessarily the same categories of experience. But the one thing that we can tell is that all of these categories are socially responsive. They reflect the makeup of the society at that time. They do things that that society wants them to do. So you don't get um, Islam before um, uh, Muhammad. Um, you don't get uh, sort of proto forms of Judaism and Christianity before these religions emerge. They are historical constructs and they emerge in that way for particular reasons. Okay, so um, the civic religions of, uh, of Classical Greece responded to a civic structure, which was basically everyone lived in a city, so you needed a religion unifying that city. Um, Christianity and Islam emerged in very sort of complex situations, but they, they gained power as part of, as somebody said earlier, as part of a kind of imperial system, so they respond very well. These centralising religions based around a single god who rules everything, they're very good allegories of empire. They do many other things as well. I'm not saying that's all they do, mm -hmm. but they are socially responsive. And if you want one very good piece of evidence for the idea that religion is a social construct, think again about gender, OK? The fact that almost every society that we've had so far has been male-dominated. Almost every religion is male-dominated. That is because the two are responding to each other, religion and society. Oh. Well, right, Charlie. Um, I hold a little twinkle in your eye yeah. there. Yeah. I, I don't have any problem with that um, as a religious leader, as a rabbi within a congregation who's dealing with real people who are scientists, doctors. What about um, the goddesses? Where are the goddesses? Yeah, I, I think we're in, I think we're re-putting them back in when we perceive God in, within, our, within our modern eyes. I don't think that there's a problem with the fact that revelation continues and that we're as religious leaders or as people who are practicing religion within a modern world, that we can't have both, that we can't understand that the way that we perceive the world is through our own construct, because we are human. And so, therefore, the way that we perceive God and the way that we perceive religion is, is limited by the fact that we're human. And so I look at my text, and obviously there are female voices missing. Um, but here I am as a woman rabbi in a progressive movement, 
know, very much a rabbi within liberal Judaism who practices her religion in a way that feels relevant and real to me. And that's because I have reconstructed my view of religion based on my own context. That doesn't mean that God doesn't exist because I happen to be limited by my own human powers. Okay, I'm going to stick with because uh, I know you've, uh, Selena O'Grady, author of And Man Created God. Where are you coming from on this one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm tough to say that. <laughs> Where are the goddesses? <laughs> the that, I mean, the but, really point very articulately put by articulately put by Tim there that the the mere you know the, the manifestation of religion in its uh, womanless form shows that it's created by men. Do you buy that? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, because but I think that the, the god that we create changes over time. So you get a Jewish god that's for a particular tribe who've lost their homeland, who says, "I'm just going to protect you lot." And if you obey my rules, I'll give you promised land. You get the, the, the Roman gods, exactly, the, which is based on the, the client-patron relationship of Rome. So you get these, these huge big patrons. If you give them a lamb, with any luck, they'll cure your fertility problems or whatever. But it's a client-patron relationship on which Rome is based. You get the Christian god, and I'm surprised that love comes in so early, because in a sense, the Christian god seems to be... The first real loving god. The, oh, that's these, 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 these Roman gods. <laughs> that's these, ridiculous. These Roman that's gods do, do do nothing but just give, just give or not. I think one the of Jewish the Jewish well, gods. But, 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 but the Jewish god, I think, is 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 for a specific people. And the thing about the, the Christian god is is that this is what Paul does so cleverly, I think, in creating Christianity, is to open up that love and protection of a particular tribe to a whole group of people <coughs> who are living in this sort of the first phase of globalization in the Roman Empire where they've lost all sense of community they're in these huge big cities oh, no. and he, okay. he he gives them a sense of look you know I love you all you love each other all in a way that that the Jewish God just goes for this particular group can, can you find anyway okay love Love. Anyone, All you need is love. Can you get no, it in previous gods and goddesses? Of course you do. And I think it's incredibly arrogant of any kind of Christian to present their own religion as somehow, or, or any idea right. of Christianity as being somehow more elevated, um, something innovative. No, I'm not saying it's more elevated. It just does it. Christian, no, it doesn't what, what, do it better. But Francesca, what are you, a biblical better. scholar or something? Exactly. That's oh, exactly. you are? Right, okay. Yeah. So. Look, I'm not saying it does it better. <laughs> you're you're it's, no, of I'm simply Jewish saying God it's was aiming, completely it's offensive. Doing, it's Absolutely. aiming. It's aiming. Really completely wait, wait, offensive. Stay. And I, I'm, I'm amazed that it's such an outdated idea. Of course the Jewish God, the God of the Hebrew Bible, is, there, is a loving God. Listen, I'm just... I'm it's saying, not about particularity. And to suggest that Christianity somehow opens up this no, massive deity that to the rest the of the God, world is incredibly yeah, outdated that's how the God was and tainted. offensive. I'm, I'm and sorry. Love is You're all speaking at once, but I want to hear... Wait, no, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I want to hear... We're having a civilised Sunday morning discussion about God. All right? Listen, what about goddesses, then? Can I please just answer this to Okay, okay, okay. Which is that I'm just saying this is how these gods arise. They arrive to fulfil particular purposes. The, the Jewish God arrived to fulfil a particular purpose sorry, for a particular set of people. Misunderstood. But yes, can we just be clear? <laughs> just one thing, which is that it is a distortion to say that either the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New Testament is probably called loving. Yeah. I can't no, think of a more, so I can't think of a more dull and spiteful right. character yeah. than the Jehovah yeah. of the Old Testament. But and anyone who looks Francesca. at the history of, for instance, the Catholic Church oh, God, could never have... OK, everybody, about, OK, I want, I want to talk about goddesses. I want to talk about goddesses. It's not a sentence I've said a lot in my life, no, no. but I do I say right now. I know you say it all the time. <laughs> Where are the goddesses? Why do the goddesses or goddess get squeezed out of the religious equation? Um, Partly because the goddesses were massively powerful and they played a really important role with the male deities, but also because gender in the ancient world, including the ancient world from which the Hebrew Bible emerged, the world from which the New Testament text emerged, their, their notion of gender was very, very different from ours. The deities had very fluid sense of gender. There wasn't just one male and one female gender. It was a very, very Transgender fluid. Transgender deities. Exactly. Yeah. And mm. they were very... And so different deities could perform mm. different roles. The goddesses become erased, um, sometimes literally in terms of their statues and their, and their cult objects, but sometimes literally as well and from the text. They're erased because of this prioritisation of a particular deity at a particular political point in a particular time in history, as Tim was saying. It's all about politics. That's why you get hierarchies. When a human society becomes more hierarchical, even a very small group, it's basically earning the money. You've got one temple, one deity, all the money from that is going to come to that temple. Whoever's in charge of the temple is going to have more political power. It's a centralisation. And that's where the idea of the prioritisation of one deity comes from. Can so I the just... goddesses never disappear. People continue to worship the goddesses. I mean, in one way, she's, she's reinvented, if you like, in the figure of 
Mary, the Queen of Heaven, within Christianity. Oh, dear. Well, the fact she's oh, 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 listen, oh, listen, listen. I, I heard, I heard out the corner of my ear. Isis. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, stalking. I'm sorry, this has been around 30 years. It's a tired, wearying concept that somehow Mary um, is, is a reincarnation of a goddess. The Queen of Heaven, um, her um, title please, is a please goddess let me title. Finish, let me finish. Um, I think what we're hearing here, and I'm interested in the debate, it's a good debate because we're looking at the social constructions of religion, the social constructions of deities and so on. And in that sense, of course, human beings have been creating gods since time immemorial and they have been worshipping them bowing down to them. They've made them of marble, stone, wood. Or trees. Trees, suns, moons and yes. so on. Everything, male and female, um, all kinds of genitalia going on within the Godhead and spurious relationships, you know, really weirdo things going on between well, women's sexual one, gods. One person's weirdo thing is another person, <laughs> you know. Leaving all <laughs> that aside, Nikki, yeah, if yeah. we're not interested in your, <laughs> in your ramifications here. Yeah. I mean, so n nobody's disputing this. I mm. mean, this, you know, any scholar, any half-baked scholar, can go to any book anywhere and find this out. <laughs> um, so why, I mean, was, why are we giving? Let me finish. Let Elaine finish, please. Please let Elaine finish. Why are we giving this an enormous intellectual status as though somehow this solves the problem of religion right through the world and explains They're who God is? They're not half-baked scholars. They're the great no, British Bake Off, full-on, <laughs> full wonderful I'm saying, caked I'm scholars. I'm any half-baked scholar could. Right. Find this information. But the point is, what we're looking at here are epistemological questions. Questions about how we know, how we do our research, what kind of research do we do, and what methodology we do use. Well, actually, the questions about God are ontological questions, about the whole nature of being. What is it to have a divine being, and what does that divine being look like? And that divine being is not something we can create. As little Olivia, a 12-year-old, said to her mother the other day, we just don't have the intelligence to create a creator. We're only mortal human beings with mortal minds. On which point, on which point, there's time, don't, don't worry everyone, there's time. Nice line, on which point, no. I, think it's a, I think it's the perfect segue now into uh, a representative of the oldest existing uh, religion on earth. No, it's not you, Abdullah. It is, it is our, our, our Hindu uh, representative, uh, Satish Sharma, General Secretary of the National Council of Hindu um, temples, oldest existing religion. So, when, um, when Hinduism first emerged, would it have been by um, revelation, uh, by intuition? I mean, you know how? It's uh, been difficult to sit here, but it's always good fun to see our adolescents at play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would just share that the lens through which all of the, this discussion has happened so far. What about the question? I just asked you. <laughs> Never mind lenses. I'll come to it. Never mind lenses. Okay. Very straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. We have a tradition which says that mystics are always followed by miscreants. And so far in the discussion, so we, we haven't really touched on the notion of a mystical experience. In our earliest records, there are records which are recorded by mystics. And in terms of our time frame, mm -hmm. we go back a little bit further than that. And we celebrated 5,154 years of the articulation of one of our core central texts because there are astronomical references within it which help us to define time frames. So we work on a different cosmology and a different time frame. But this notion that mystics are always followed by miscreants is very, very valuable. There is, there is a, an established tradition. We have thousands of books and they're all the records of people who have engaged in some sort of a practice involving them introverting and connecting with a sense of union with every other creature on the planet and every on the planet itself and they've tried to articulate that but when you articulate a personal experience to people who haven't had that experience their chattering minds get involved and so that's where the miscreants come and there are always miscreants who are happy to leverage the adulation that mystics seem to get for political purposes so we have a, a precision that we need to that we would apply and that is you use the term religion we would say that when you say religion, you're actually discussing theocracies. Our perspective is that theocracies are merely dictatorships with an invisible, immortal dictator who cannot be deposed. And they're the ideal tool for anybody wanting to exert political power. So we would separate We've had a bit of that so far. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually very relevant because at this time we have two theocracies from our perspective our perspective battling for primacy of power on the, on the earth and indeed uh, in, in this country. Uh, it's wonderful here, we have a tradition of democracy 
which is battling with theocracy as well. And you know, the House of Commons was established as a challenge to the Church of England. And autocracy, so the, throw that one in yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But the, the notion of the mystical experience is, has primacy with us. Once a person's had a mystical experience, then you recognise that actually that mystical experience represents itself in a gender-free environment. Uh, our, our tradition, 5,000 years, we would say a lot more than 5,000 years, we have never had a theocracy in India. And that's because of the multiplicity, the pure democracy of how you wish to engage well, like the caste with system. divinity. <laughs> well, caste is a Portuguese word, and like all words, words have concepts behind them. Mm. There is no word in the Indian Sanskrit or indeed the Hindu vocabulary for caste. I would share with you that caste is something that was exported to India, and it has no place in the Indian um, scriptures. Still got it, though. Nor indeed practice. Ar uh, in a minute, Cole, Arif. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think Satish actually put his finger on an important distinction. He did. There is a difference between the sort of votive side of religion and the mystery side of religion, the side which involves social interactions and the side which involves a kind of inner experience. And it's true that a lot of these explanations we've been discussing are to do with religion as a social phenomenon, but there is something else as well, which is the, yeah. the, the mystical mm. experience. But of course, that's not to say that that has got no explanation. <laughs> There's a variety of competing psychological explanations for that to do with behaviour of the temporal lobes and various other sorts of theories. Many of them... Certainly one of them is true, and many of them have a great deal more plausibility than the idea that any religious claim but is true. So, so I think the conclusion would be that, that religion obviously has a variety of explanations because it covers a variety of phenomena. And, and I, wouldn't, that's, that's I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of I, 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 OK, I want, to, I want to just move it on slightly, <coughs> but, uh, Selena, you, you, you yes. have been trying to jump back in. We're going so to even call in a second. I'd love to say two things. I, and I'm telling you, let me announce, right. let me make an announcement. We're going to talk about the relationship between religions and God and no God in just a second. So it, you've led us very nicely into it, Satish, uh, organised yes, religion. Go We've but been doing this a long time. Are you be, you've, you've been very <laughs> desperate to say something. I want to say two things. One is that Isis was a, a goddess and she did incredibly well. Um, she, she really was a kind of... It felt like a sort of world-beater religion that was going to do far better than this little um, Christian Jesus cult. What happened? She didn't do it as well as as, um, as 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 Jesus and and Christianity did under Paul, which is she started addressing these questions of a personal relationship with your with, with her devotee, of promising some kind of afterlife. It wasn't quite clear whether it was going to be just longer life or afterlife. Of giving you a sense of community, of doing all these things. Mm -hmm. But the, that little Jewish cult under Paul did all this much much better and gave you, mm -hmm. which I think Teresa kind of didn't say in your that you know that why we need God and why God is there which is a sense of of of, of aught that's yeah. what religions do so well which is actually give you a sense of values and how you should lead your, your, your <laughs> was, 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 she, was she not apocalyptic was she <laughs> no no, 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 no she's very much the other ISIS. what Christ was a, what Christ was an apocalypticist wasn't he Absolutely. he was yeah the, 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 well there's lots of yes, evidence that Christ was an apocalyptic in the sense that he was a messiah and that the end of the world would come in your time he said to his disciples in your time yes yeah, and they got, yeah. he got that wrong <laughs> <laughs> he got well you know Cole Morton haven't yeah. heard from Cole yet um, now you're, a, you're yeah. a very very intelligent man and a marvellous writer yes. you, you're not a great fan of religion Religions. You're not a great fan of religions, but you're a big fan of God. I know that, if that's, yeah. if that's fair to say. Mm -hmm. If there is no God, can you understand the uh, logic of the development of religion in our minds? Absolutely, I can. I'm not a theologian or a scientist, I'm just a storyteller. And I know that when you start to tell a story, one of the things that happens next is that people begin to take control of the story. They say, this is my story, and maybe it forms their community, maybe it forms their identity, maybe they go to war on the basis of it. And what we've seen in religion is we've seen that, um, I mean, one of the reasons why we talked about the goddess, one of the reasons why the goddess is very popular in contemporary culture, why neo-paganism is embracing the goddess in a big way, is because we've had many, many years of patriarchal oppressive religions. So that is bubbling up and, and we're seeing that. But we're now in a, also in a place where one of the stories that people are telling is um, we, can, we, we actually have grown up, we understand the world better, we can do all of this on the basis of rationality and science. And therefore, as, as you said earlier, you know, all of these stories from all of these places have now got to be judged on the basis of science. Well, that's another perspective. It's another act of faith. And when I, when I think of the... It's not an act of faith, no, Cole. It's, it's, it's empirical. Be evidence well, uh, uh, well uh, OK, I mean, if, you, if you're telling me that you, you think that science uh, ultimately science contains works. all of the answers... Science works. Well, Brain I'm not doesn't. talking about working. And this, and and science is, is tentative. That's the beauty of science. Yeah, but this, uh, indeed it is when it's done properly. But what I'm talking about is, is um, 
We can it's describe it's what, tested we and can survived. describe what is happening in front of us Repeatable. in all these different ways, but that doesn't take away the sense of mystery, the sense of there is something else. And it, and it may be that all of these competing stories have an element of truth in their own way, but what they're not doing is Cole, revealing to us... aren't you in the danger there. of falling into the notorious god of the gaps here? That once upon a time they were saying, the thing is, there's always going to be a mystery, we're never going to understand what thunder <clears> is. Then they understand it and the gap moves elsewhere. You're in this subatomic world. We're never going to understand the subatomic no, world. It. That's Bring where it. God is. And then when we understand the subatomic world, you've got a problem. Uh, yeah, well, we're 96% 90, of matter. We don't know what it is at the moment. You know, I mean, but when, when we do, when, when you go <laughs> sub, <laughs> when you go sub <laughs> atomic, <laughs> the mystery widens. When you go cosmic, the mystery God widens. Is in the I want, see, I, want, I want to just say the gaps, gaps are moving. They're moving. I want, I want to tell you something well. from the Indus Valley. Okay, this is this is my favourite story about this. There's there's six white, uh, six blind men. They're blindfolded in a room <laughs> and they're holding on to this this creature and they're saying, "What is this creature?" And one of them saying, "Well, it's a rope. It feels like a rope." Another one's saying it feels like a sail. Another one's saying it feels like a great big tree trunk. They're all grasping onto different aspects of an elephant. The elephant is still there, even while they're arguing about what the elephant is really and like. And the message is be careful what you grasp, especially <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Aris, do you want to come back in uh, here? Uh, Science. Yeah, I mean, one thing, about, one thing that I would say about Then the we'll move on to religion. That, of course, of course there have been, as you said, Nicky, low, you know, thousands of, of gaps, as in things we couldn't explain at the time. Every single one of them that has been explained by science hasn't been explained by religion. So we've got about as good evidence as you could possibly ha have. That no gap concerning our understanding can be filled by, by these religious beliefs. Okay. On the point about mystery, I mean, I agree that in a sense, a lot, you know, one needn't be a materialist or something. Um, you can certainly think that, that you know, there, are, there are other things in life, there are things that have value to people and so on, but people can have value for each other. People can care about things that matter, like uh, music, the arts or science, one another, personal relationships, political activism. There are so many things in life that can matter to people and give life meaning well, that have got nothing to do... What you're doing is claiming... You're doing the same as the religions are doing and claiming this is my story and my story is true. No, no, let's move... No, no, I want to move on to... Really, we can pick up that to monotheism and religions in general. Islam, the new kid on the block, Abdullah, came along... came along very, very recently. And uh, you've got well been here for a couple of years. Yeah, well, no, you, you've been coming on this show for about three years. But yeah. Islam itself came along what seventh century was it? Uh, something like yeah. that. So, but Muhammad Muhammad in the six seventies, something like that. And so um, basically, we've got this religious monotheism. A great, we, we've had mention of this already. It's a great means of political control and empire building, isn't it? And uh, you know the Islamic empire, one flag, one empire, one nation, one people. It wasn't really an and empire, so, but. Well, it's it not. turned into an empire after that. But you can understand the logic, can't you? Taking it away from uh, your religious belief, you can understand the logic of and the efficacious, politically efficacious nature of monotheism. Uh, not really. People can be oh, really? the same God and be divided. It doesn't make any difference. But it's better um, than polytheism. But, lots but, of different but, gods, but the, the, the point I've been trying to highlight is, firstly, uh, science itself is limited to the, na the natural world. Yep. And we don't put religion into the natural world in terms of, well, at least Muslims and, and Jews and others don't put religion into the natural science saying, this is miraculous here and here and here. Um, religion is, uh, science is limited to the goldfish bowl of this universe, mm -hmm. an opaque goldfish bowl. And if it's these two atheist goldfish inside this goldfish bowl, would think there's nothing outside their goldfish bowl. But rational, rationally, you can deduce there must be something outside it. And this is where rationality and a pure mm. uh, atheist... Uh, empiricism clash. Well, I, I want to talk less matter. about that than the, than the development of, of religious in, social control. Well, 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 see, the thing is this. Um, Military control. Well, the thing is this. We, we approach this history with an anachronistic, secular kind of perspective. Um, in, in the Indian culture, for example, Dharma was, I suppose, um, what they would call their entire culture. Dharma meaning law. And, of course, the, the Torah, it, the word means law as well. Mm -hmm. um, the re religion, law. religion, culture, law were all one and the same thing. Secularism is a very modern construct. People didn't divide religion here. Every uh, country, in a way, or every civilization was, quote-unquote, a theocracy in that sense, because everyone's <laughs> politics was driven by their morals, which was driven by their belief in, uh, in afterlife, in gods, in, in the cosmology, and so on. And the modern day, the and modern day, for land and, and, and the modern day religion that controls people <laughs> is nationalism. I would say yeah. because we, we get uh, the current uh, ruling party um, telling us that we will have to follow, for example, British values to unite this Another country. Another debate. Well, exactly. <laughs> but, that, but that's also a, uh, that's also uh, you, you could argue that's also means. Of Let control. me try it again, uh, Theresa Morgan. In terms of in terms of social control, Theresa, mm. for rulers, for chiefs, for kings. For, uh, for, 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 the, for tribal chiefs, whatever. Um, religion is handy, isn't it? Oh, no question. Religion is very handy. 
Uh, but anybody can use more or less anything uh, to exert social control. I mean, uh, democracy is, um, is a value which um, uh, autocrats can subvert for their own use. Autocrats can subvert doesn't anything for their own use. Fine, doesn't, doesn't invalidate it. I mean, mm. so in a sense, that's neither here nor there. I think, in a way, you are underestimating the extent to which uh, religions are also countercultural and mm. um, demand things of their adherents that are unexpected and often, on the face of it, unhelpful. I mean, I, I certainly feel that in trying seriously to follow my own faith tradition um, in my daily job, I am constantly shooting myself in the foot and doing things that actually will not serve me well. well you but know, Jesus Christ socially. himself was extremely bothersome, wasn't he? And Quite. And Didn't him a bit of good. Yeah. Quite. Um, I mean, so, and, and that's true. I mean, that's even true of traditions like um, uh, Greek and Roman religions, I think, Tim may disagree with me, but uh, who, uh, which um, it is easy for us to think about in rather socially reductionist terms as reflecting and serving social and political systems because there are no longer um, living believers in those systems to kind of give a different view. But um, <coughs> for, if you think, for instance, about a concept <coughs> like justice, dikaiosin or dikai in the Greek world, it has, a whole, it has several different ranges of meaning. Uh, justice can mean what is socially normative, whatever the mass of people think is okay. It can mean uh, what the law says is okay, which may not be the same as current public opinion or what the current mm. leaders of the city want. Or it can mean what the gods think is justice. Um, and uh, Greeks often struggled a lot with their sense of what the gods thought justice was, which didn't always fit with their sense of justice at all, um, either because it was more demanding or because it looked actually cruel or random. You know, both those, you know, people protest against the justice of the gods, both that it's cruel, that it doesn't fit what we would hope for, but also that it's too high a standard for us to kind of aspire to. So in all sorts of that ways, even God Greek and Roman religion... God knows best comes mm. in, so, it? so all sorts of religions, and it's true all the way through the Hebrew Bible, it's true in Christian tradition, certainly, the traditions that I know a bit more about, that uh, they can be intensely demanding from a perspective wholly outside society's norms, actually. And Tim, you were, you were mentioning yeah, well, no, I mean, I just, in dispatches. Um, actually, <laughs> agree with an awful lot of that. I mean, I do think that um, the issue is not whether um, religion can only be used by dominant forces in society. I mean, religion, um, if you believe that religion is a social construct, construct, which I do, then clearly it follows that societies um, are much more than just their dominant forces. So, I mean, we see it in the modern world, we see, you know, whether it's talking about liberation theology, Salafism or anything like this, you know, there are ways of being countercultural through the religious idiom. Mm. But th that doesn't necessarily mean that religion... So the question really is here is what is driving what, isn't it? And I think that's the... And I'm kind of quite open-minded about this, actually, but the question is whether religion is something that we can identify as distinct from society mm. that somehow stands behind it and pushes it forward, which is, seems to me more of a kind of a believer's point of view, or whether, as I would see it, religion is actually part of the idiom of a given society and is a flexible medium that can be used by different people for different purposes because, hey, yes, yeah, societies are complex. Isn't that Ru the Ru Rupert, no, Ru Rupert, Rupert, we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, welcome. Um, isn't the, as, we, as we're on religion, isn't it the inevitable consequence <clears> of <throat> monotheism, uh, an in-group and an out-group? Uh, a them and an us. We, we know the truth and they don't. No, absolutely not. I mean, one of the questionable statements made so far today is uh, uh, if I think my religion is right, then the other 99,000 are, are wrong. I think, on, on the contrary, it's a consequence of believing in the, um, that, that we're all made in the image of God that uh, makes some... Um, uh, the... the, the, the core element of Christianity, the, 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 what I take away from the story of the lost sheep is that it, it's actually people who are outside. But we've had countless over the years, countless people of all, all faiths uh, who have been strict adherence to the thought, not, not everybody of course, but of, of certain faiths, strict adherence to the thought that they are right, theirs is the only way, and everyone Catholic else Church. is wrong. Yes, Catholic I'm not Church saying... Catholic Church is notorious for killing uh, absolutely. I'm not saying that the, the message hasn't been corrupted. I'm going to a, a, 
slightly higher authority in what, what I believe about God. It's always very to defend and, religion and, and by above. pretending that what you want its message to be has actually been corrupted by the way it's played out and it's, in history. It's, it's, it's very hard to think... No, no, it's true. No, it's, it's not. Very it's disingenuous, and I'll tell you why. Because, because it's more historically verified. It's disingenuous to take the authority, to take the institution of religion and, and, and judge a, 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 a set of beliefs on the basis of what some people have done in that institution is disingenuous. What Rupert is talking about is what, the, what his particular religion calls us to, which is a higher kind of love, and actually, you know, you know that's the, the two things are completely A higher different. kind of love than what? Um, you know, if, 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 if you... If, well, Rupert of, can answer it's that. It's the priority of the uh, outsider, I think. The, uh, the, the idea that... I mean, the, the church is sometimes said to be the, the one organisation that exists for the sake of its non-members, and when... <laughs> When, when Jesus' <laughs> teaching is being taken seriously, I mean, that's the, that's the, the big question. I wouldn't deny... I, good good heavens, it's, it's because I'm a Christian that I've got fairly robust views on the dysfunctionality of the church. Yeah, but when, when, when the gospel is taken seriously, then uh, the, the, the message, surely no one would, would deny that, that at, at the core of Jesus' message, whether one accepts it or not, is, 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 is one of radical self-giving love. Okay. Then so it's not about them enough. Audience, uh, let's have some thoughts from the audience. Uh, gentleman there, uh, hello, yeah, hmm. on you go. Um, so, essentially... Mm. Um, quick, quick points, well, please. Okay, yeah. so, so it seems to me that um, the, the question, did man create God, uh, what the Honourable Rabbi said earlier is very important. Ultimately, any, any conception of God that we have is going to be through our hearts and minds, through two ears, one nose, two eyes, one brain, and so um, of two course it's going to be in the case of some two of these brains. brains of course, yeah, maybe two brains in the front yeah. row. But um, it seems that you know, so obviously it's going to be anthropomorphized. Um, so the, the question then becomes, you know, does God exist? Which is of course an impossible question. Um, and I think, although this question is important, maybe uh, one which might be more worthwhile asking is how does how does God, um, or whatever we mean by God realise himself in our hearts and minds. Exactly. Um, and it's too late, we're 40 minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, I mean, but, but this is interesting about social constructs and so forth. Lady down the red top, just for a quick point from you, go on. Just going off the point he just made, um, does God exist? I don't believe it's an impossible question to answer. It's just that it's whether or not people want to believe that God exists or not. And I believe that the evidence of God is mm. all around us. If only we were to open up our eyes and accept that. <laughs> Bruce Hood, what does the concept of a divine judge, if you've been good, if you've been bad, tell us about, uh, in your view, the societies from which it comes? We've heard a lot about love, haven't we? Um, mm. But I have to point out that a lot of religion is fear, and that works in that way. And that's a way in which you can um, improvise or you can put into place social control um, by not breaking the moral code. So a lot of religions are based on, on fear, fear of death, fear of infertility, fear of poverty, and fear of retribution. So one of the, the ideas... The fires of hell. Fires of hell. I mean, if you just have to look through the history, it's quite clear, not only are they attacking other religions, but within, the, within their own, uh, they're using that to control people. So I think that's something... It's not about control, it's about accountability. Right, right. Like, it's like, still, uh, it's still. You don't want, you don't want like um, Hitler getting off scot free in the afterlife, right? You want him to be punished, or, or at least, uh, at least there should be some accountability. It might be a better religion, religion if you didn't control. want Hitler getting off scot free in the afterlife. I, if you I, believed in a god of forgiveness, actually, that might be better. I see, the well, I, I, okay, well, we're still over here because it's interesting. That was, that was an interesting little diversion there, but the, this whole idea of uh, of hell and of punishment. Carry on. Bruce. Yeah. So there's research showing that children will spontaneously. Uh, think or behave themselves if they think there's a ghost in the room or they think that they're being observed by some supernatural agent. And one of the ideas is that we then kind of transpose that father figure or that, that authority figure to become a divine god so that becomes a moral compass for you know, how we behave. Yeah, there's an ancient Greek who said exactly that in 5th century BC. He said that um, there was a wise lawgiver who gave us laws and then we carried on being naughty in practice in, in private. Uh, and then that wise lawgiver also invented religion so that we would be pleased in private as well. It's exactly the same idea. I mean, Speculation. That's in the Bible as well. Speculation, <laughs> says Abdullah. <laughs> yeah. Elaine, I, I want to hear from, uh, from Satish in a second, but Elaine, I, I, I feel I want to hear from you on this. <laughs> I, I, I want to hear your, your wisdom and your thoughts on, on this idea of uh, divine judgment. Sh to, to the casual observer, it looks uh, like a, a human construct. Yes, and, and in many ways, the way in which we go about 
uh, fabricating judgment and uh, pronouncing judgment on one another is very human. And it's, it's about blame. It's about um, vindicating one's self-righteousness. And we, we have all kinds of mechanisms for handling this in society after society where people will not put their hands up and say, yeah, I was wrong. I made a mess. I screwed this up. I'm the guilty one. Please forgive me. Um, the point about religion is... The that punishment. It, yeah, but the, point, the punishment is, is almost irrelevant. It's a secondary issue. The big issue is... Not if you're being punished. The big, no. the big issue is, <laughs> what, why do people do this? Why do people relate to each other in this kind of way? Mm. And what do they expect as a result of it? And um, Arif earlier on said that uh, science has explained so many things and religious explain, uh, religion explains none of these things that science has explained. This is not what religion is about. Religion, and I would include many scientific religions in this. Which uh, scientific religions? Uh, uh, secular religions, which are scientistic. In other words, they have faith in science as producing all the answers, all the uh, understanding and so on. Yeah. Communism. It's, it's not, it's not faith. But let, it's let not faith. Well, it's it's I ask for that is an, that's a very vital point to get a quick response on before we proceed. Uh, so it's it's not, yeah, just on that particular point, it's, it's a common trope amongst theists and it's a complete completely false to say that science is some kind of faith. There is no better evidence for anything than there is for any of the many scientific theories I could mention, like quantum theory. Are you saying quantum theory is a faith? Are you of saying not, relativity is a faith? No, no, you're not listening. You're not listening. You're not listening. What is the thing that you're calling a faith? You're not listening. A bunch of scientists always want to disagree with, with each other, always want to disprove each other, and that's the dynamic of science, which is absolutely... Let me get back there, to punishment. There, there is... No, let me just say where science I am, because method. I need to finish this now. OK. Scientism is a faith in science. It's a faith that actually science ultimately will have all the answers to all the questions that we can have. Because often science simply does not have even all the questions. So it's the, got the, more answers than it did have. So it's moving. Yeah, it's moving it like that. Of the course, gap's getting it's smaller wonderful. and smaller. It's fantastic yes, that we actually. Have there are developed. scientists with Can I just what finish what I'm trying to say? Of course there are. So basically, what's going on with all of these kind of um, positions, whether they're religious positions, whether they're secular positions, whether they're p political positions, and so on, is that they're offering people worldviews. And worldviews are those things that are actually underneath all of our social ramifications and our societal developments. Okay. So worldviews are answering fundamental questions like who or what is God? Yeah, okay. Who well, am I? What is it to be a human But they would being? say the non-overlapping magisteria, they're separate. Some, you've got to say, I mean, what is right, reality? Cole's right. We're going to go to Satish. I mean, some of the great scientists are theists. Some of the great evolutionary biologists, Ken Miller, Francisco Ayala, are, are theists. Can, I, can I make so a point about that? Are, which it's makes it's the point that they are, they are separate magisteria. Satish, I want to hear from Satish. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why I want to hear from Satish. Because if we're talking about divine punishment or retribution or reward, you are on a constant, as we all are, as you believe, a constant cycle of reincarnation until we reach a stage where we are free from birth and free from death. And that's a kind of, uh, that's an, quite an optimistic view, ultimately, because uh, we're all heading in the right direction, despite the fact that we may have some diversions along the way. Well, starting Would that be an accurate way of putting yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's not too bad. Starting from the <laughs> premise that both cannot be proven, that either we're doomed and we have to be redeemed or that we're actually on a positive journey, assuming for a moment that neither can be proven, the more positive one would seem to be more reasonable to adopt. But turning to whether it can be proven, pure scientific method, replicable, something that anybody can do, mm -hmm. requires, if you want to establish, did the mystic establish a connection with some divine entity, you follow and replicate his experiment. You don't talk about it. You, you actually go, be still and know that I am divinity. And so unless you have actually done that, then it's all noise. It's just mental um, cogitations and... Uh, what's, one of, what's one of these mystic, <coughs> mystical events like? What is, it, what is it like to experience? Have some of us experienced it before when we've been listening to, I don't know, Elgar's cello concerto or Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club? Have we experienced it? Have we gone in a kind of state that you're... What are you talking about? What in is fact, it? I would suggest that it's, it's the natural default for all of us. Um, How do we, we are all it? created to experience something within us which, when it's removed, this body falls apart and decays and decomposes. Have some of us uh, experienced um, it without realising that it's a mystical thing? I mean, what is yeah, it? Um, I would suggest yeah. that there are... The chattering of, of the mind, once that ceases, then you start to have an opening inside. Francesca. And that opening is the first of, of the journeys. But Fran there's something Francesca said, which I wanted to touch on, which is to do with gender and to do with creating then gods. Then she can answer you, can't right? <laughs> Misogynists create misogynist gods. Yeah. Right? You can identify the nature of the person who has created that god, and indeed that then reeks of a, a, theoc a theocracy in its birth. Where there is divinity, 
there has to be no violence. It can't be intellectually violent, it can't be emotionally violent, and it can't be physically violent. Mm -hmm. If there is any violence present, there is no divinity present. There. So there's no divinity in any of the major religions in that case? <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> I started... Francesca, your answer is he, he directed nonsense. something None towards, of the major towards you, Francesca. I think it's a real shame that, um, and we find this, I mean, there's, there's a lot about Hinduism that I, I particularly like, actually, as, as opposed to a lot of other religions, but I think it's a real shame that in all of the people representing different religions here, they're so down on humanity and what it is to be a person. Why do you want to get rid of the human body? Bodies well, are amazing. What's wrong with the no, material no, world? No, we have What's not wrong with that. experiencing? Nobody said that. I'm, I'm, you're I'm, you're I'm, putting I'm, words into our mouths. For as many li lifetimes Dying as you wish. Down. But that's the but thing. But what is it? what it? But all of the... But religion seems to want to be able to offer some kind of an escape from the world that we no, have no, now, that, the world that, that we live in. That's a parody. No, is that, is that, that, Rabbi, Rabbi Judaism, Charlie, Rabbi Charlie, Judaism honey. Judaism is so much about this world. It's not about it is, yes. doing things because mm. right now because of the reward in the next world. It's very much, and I think a lot, of, a lot of Jews would talk about their relationship with God as in their relationship with other human beings. It's not about uh, the future, it's about right now. And, when, no, and because of that, the body is very much part of the soul. One of the first blessings that Jews would say when they get up in the morning is one to thank that the body still works. That our, Tell me that about we, it. Yeah, well, absolutely, it's a great thing to be thankful for. And it's not about separating the soul from the body, but actually the, the, the reality is in that relationship that actually we find God. How, 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 how much of your day, agree, Abdullah, do you spend? Because some people such, say that, that Islam too. is very much thinking about what will happen in the afterlife, and it's kind of quite afterlife-centric a lot of the time. How often do you think about the afterlife? Well, you know what? I mean, if uh, you have to look at human existence, if we believe that human existence is, is there's more than just this life, mm. we shouldn't ne neglect our portion of world of uh, our worldly portion, as the Quran says. We do not neglect your worldly portion, but at the same time, also work towards something greater. People, even atheists, would work towards a future for their kids they will never see, which is beyond their lifetime. So they're working for something outside sure. their lifetime. Yes. But the, the point I really wanted to raise today is. Um, Man didn't really create God. God created man, and man created idols. And we shouldn't throw yes. God out with the idols, okay? Because they're, 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 they're different. They're different things. They're different things. And, and atheists do not have a monopoly on scientists. For the vast majority of human that. history, Arif. I said that. Uh, Arif. Scientists have yes, been thieves. I said that. Arif. Well, I know. Yeah, thanks. I know. Like, and, evolutionary and, biologists, as I said. But there is no, oh, there is no, there is no clash between um, no, God and Thank you very much. Non-overlapping yeah. magisteria, <laughs> just like you two. Arif. Yeah. I, mean, I think one thing about Islam is, is, is that actually, in many ways, Islam is very focused on, on life in this world in a way that Christianity isn't. So, for instance, Islam places constraints on a great deal of people's everyday behaviour that Christianity doesn't. It constrains your financial transactions, it constrains your personal hygiene, it constrains the way you dress, mm -hmm. it constrains a vast amount of people's lives. So in many ways, it's, it's, total, <laughs> it's, it's, it's Very negative to term. totalitarian. And the other thing I would say is that, of course, Islam is not the only one. These other religions do, but... Many religions have a, have a very severe and deleterious effect on people's lives in this world. If you think all the people who are homosexual and the things they've suffered because of religion. Firstly, all the people everyone's have AIDS, conscience is all totalitarian. The things, all the right, things wait. that are going on in Raqqa everyone's, and everybody's in conscience Raqqa and is totalitarian. Jeddah right now wait, wait, because every, of your religion. Wait, wait everyone's conscious. Wait, that might be um, easy for you to say, but the, yeah, everyone's, conscious, wait, <laughs> everyone's conscience conscience is a totalitarian. Everyone's conscience guides them throughout the entire day. What, what do you mean do everyone's conscience is totalitarian? Yes, because... What does that mean? Well, totalitarian means if it, it encompasses every aspect of your life. So uh, we would like to think that a person's conscience would guide them through every aspect of their life, what they do, how they treat people, um, helping people and so on. Everyone's conscience is totalitarian. You're just saying the word, this is totalitarian. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A person, a person, a person does not have a totalitarian conscience a is a hypocrite who acts on pragmatic my principles, doesn't tell which me are selfish. Dress. My conscience doesn't then. tell me... What? Not based on higher principles. My conscience doesn't tell me I should prostrate myself in a certain direction five times a day. Well, that's because we disagree. My, my Elaine Stocky, let's get yes. on to the basic point. And I know you're, you're, you're going off on a, a flight of fantastic, erudite, <laughs> philosophical, theological rhetoric, as you do, and that's why we have you on here we, we cherish your your presence let me I'll answer this question there are I had Brian Cox t talking the other day oh, yes. about the cosmos and about the universe yes and it's just overwhelmingly awesome uh, and it's, yes. it's mind-bogglingly wonderful mm -hmm. and he said there are but out there there are billions of planets where it is quite possible that there will be life mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. say that there were to be a planet there with intelligent life and there is mm -hmm. every possibility that that is the case mm -hmm. somewhere 
we may never, we will never know about yes. it, would they have the same God that we do? Of course, of course. Because if we, <laughs> if God is creator, if God is creator of the entire They'd universe... They'd be monotheists, would they? If God, no, monotheism, is, that's just the word. Um, okay. But it would be the same God. <laughs> the God who created the whole of entirety. He or she would have trans transmitted <clears throat> the, 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 the divinity, God consciousness to them. The, the understanding of God is that God is mm. actually the eternal creator, the one who put everything into place. The Big Bang, and within, within seconds of the Big Bang, all of the, f the structures and the fabrics of the possibility of creation were already there, and we've been working on those structures ever since. And so the, the concept of God as creator, and then God as incarnate. I mean, the whole Creating point a world that created itself. As yes, well. that, that carries Aquinas. on working with God, creating itself, but then God becoming part of the world. And this is why Francesco is so utterly wrong about the fact that the that Christianity doesn't care about the body of course it does Christ became a body he was a body and all he lived the along other people through he through as a well. right, Francesca, no, to Francesca through got to answer that question wait let's get let's get a clear answer go on it's in order to push through mortality, in order to deny human experience. Not at this all. Is, this no. is a, this in is order a to God who became love. a human who supposedly didn't have sex, didn't have very many, much to do with women, told people oh, to please, reject give their family. Well, give us told a people to I'll reject I'll their I'll be back with you. I'll be back with you. I'm talking about you. the biblical portrayal. Obviously, I don't believe this. That he told people to reject their family and to give up on their sense of tradition. This is not a God who cherishes what it is to be a human by becoming materially embodied. This is about a God that puts it on like a dressing gown and then takes it off again. It's absolutely ridiculous to think that that poor, crumpled corpse on a cross is somehow a celebration of what it is to be human. Well, the right, well then I think I do have a right well, to reply. You do have a right to reply, yeah. of course you but do. First of all, Jesus was very, very fully human in the sense that he, what, yeah, he was well, there yeah, to demonstrate, he demonstrate love. Um, he was there to actually call human beings to a different kind of life, a different life of love towards one another, love towards God, of actually well-being, of going the extra mile, of forgiveness, most of all of forgiveness, of not yes, allowing somebody else, Jewish please guy. let me finish, not allowing yeah. somebody oh, else's damage to damage you, but to actually be yeah, able to transcend that. Now, the reason. whole issue of women, of women. Is, is such a nonsense because uh, the people who supported Jesus financially were women. Some of the greatest disciples were women. The women who were the ones who went okay, out and the message. And yet, where are these women represented in the religion? Where are these oh, goddesses? All over where the place. The, oh. I'm afraid you need to read the Gospels better. And <laughs> I'm going to stay with the women, right? <laughs> you need to. No, no, no. She's a biblical scholar, to be fair. Well, there's scholarship and scholarship. No, and where Francesca? Oh, oh, he's the text. oh hang on. And listen, to listen. Right, this is good. I'm going to stay with this one. Francesca. The scholarship I, and scholarship. Yeah, what I find really interesting about scholarship quite often is there's an awful lot of intellectual gatekeeping and there's an awful lot of um, older generation scholars who like to keep younger scholars down. Um, no. my, there's nothing wrong with my <laughs> oh, scholarship, no. I assure you. OK, I think, to be fair to, to um, Francesca, where I agree God with you... God bless the peacemakers, <laughs> that's what I say. Um, I have a great deal of sympathy with both of you, I would like to say. Um, I mean... Oh, where I sympathise with you, as I don't think I don't think it is sensible to deny that there is um, a very world-denying and body-denying strain in Christianity. There's no question. But all the major religious traditions that we're talking about are very complex things, um, and they have within them both, uh, you know, they have things about them that are that we may find difficult and not like a world-denying strain in Christianity. I don't like very much um, a strain in Christianity which colludes with worldly rulers. I don't like very Absolutely. much. But that's not the whole of the tradition. Mm -hmm. One thing I find, um, we were talking a minute ago about science and religion, one thing I find um, discouraging a little bit about debates between science and religion and scientists It's not really religion, what this is, but yeah. Well, yeah. well, we have been talking about it, and um, I think it's, kind of, it's an important kind of framing issue in the argument, is that um, we think about and talk about and evaluate science on its aspirations, on the best of it, on what it hopes to achieve. Mm -hmm. We slightly tend to ignore all the ways in which science is also socially framed and socially it's controlling. It's self-regulating, that's the point um, about well, it. But it's not. It's, it's drug company regulated, it's politically oh, well, that's regulated. Right. Well, that's not science. That's, that's, science. that's, that's not science. science. That's not science. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, no, no, Bruce, you, Bruce, Bruce, I, Bruce, go on. No, no, get respond. That's quite a thing to say. Point. Bruce. No, no, no. That's fundamentally wrong. No, no. No, no, no. You, you have to sign a declaration if you have a conflict of interest if you're producing a scientific paper. Now, of course, drug companies are driving the agenda, but a good scientist will be accountable. The results will be replicable. Everything will be evidence-based. Unrepeatable. Last word, the last word, thing and thing it's about. going to be a 20-second sentence from the Cole Morton. Cole Morton, and we'll, 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 as long as we're on the planet Homo sapiens, will God be around? Yes. God uh, created man and woman equal in his image. 
and it's preposterous to think that Christians exist on another planet. But if, if God does exist, then that God exists in that other planet, and it's the kind of God that Elaine and Arif and Francesca and my friend here are all trying to describe and to get to or to ignore. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much indeed. That was for you, that round of applause. As ever, debates continue on until the next Sunday. We're live from Oxbridge. Do join us then from now. It's goodbye from everyone here in Oxford and have a great Sunday. Thanks again for watching.